and then that means as I say it can it can be published so yes uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the session today um, my name is Sarah Brain and I'm one of three consultant social workers with the West Midland Social Work Teaching Partnership so we're one of 27 accredited social work teaching partnerships funded by the Department for Education to strengthen the quality of education for social work students and practitioners across the West Midlands the partnership includes local authorities, children's trusts, NHS trusts and higher education institutes. We have a total of 27 partners and the aim is to bring together practitioners, senior managers, academics, researchers and experts by experience to support us in our work and improving social work education and social work practice. And one of the areas we've been working on this year has been to improve social workers access to research and supporting them to apply messages from research to inform their practice. And one of the ways we hope to do this is through these seminars. So this is a second one of hopefully many more to come. And this seminar will be led by Simon Horworth, who's a social work lecturer from the University of Birmingham. And he's going to present his research on child neglect and the tools we can use to measure and assess child neglect. Before Simon Before. begins, before Sam begins his presentation, we're just going to hear from Joanne McCormack from NICE, who's going to briefly talk about the role of NICE and their role within um, social work research and practice. That's brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Thank Sarah. And I'll just reiterate for anybody who's just joining, because I can see people still arriving from the lobby, that this is recorded this session, just to remind people. Um, I was just going to take just a few minutes at the start of this seminar just really to put the context uh, around research and I work for NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. It's a Department of Health government funded public body, many of you may be aware of. It's got that responsibility for providing evidence based guidance for health and social care and it's been doing it for over 20 years now. It works to improve that quality safety and equity of care. We're trying to ensure better outcomes for people who are using those services. And its aim is to put that evidence at the heart of health and care decision making. So when NICE is asked to put together guidance on a topic, there's quite a robust process, which includes putting together a committee of independent experts, lay people, service users and frontline staff and they meet several times over the course of a guideline development. So the committee reviews all the available evidence on the topic, everything that's ever been published. It also not only looks at the effectiveness but the extent of uncertainty, some social values in that, the practicalities of implementation as well as cost effectiveness. So having reviewed all the available evidence, NICE publishes these recommendations on what's safe, effective and cost effective practice. And that's across health, public health and social care. Now, where NICE would like to say something, but there's a gap in the evidence, NICE will often make recommendations for research. So it highlights the research question that's outstanding and the rationale behind that. You can view all of our recommendations and those for research on the website on what's called a guideline or that topic landing page and very specific for that topic. We highlight what's those gaps in that evidence. Uh, very often um, they will go forward for calls, funding calls uh, for projects. The National Institute uh, for Health Research will take those forward as sort of a, as a rolling programme as well. And what NICE wants to do is support you in your practice. I've just pulled up an example of a typical guideline landing page. You can see on that left hand side um, recommendations that you can click on. You can also click on the recommendations for research to see what those are on this particular topic. Just below that, we have update information. So if you've looked at that guideline some stage in the past, you can see specifically just the things that have been updated since you've looked at it before. The four or five biggest things that are not being implemented nationally, we put as a quality standard if people are looking to do that quality improvement. So you can just look at four or five statements to see what's that biggest gap nationally in, in people uh, implementing this. And we always have tools and resources across that ribbon across the top um, to help with implementing our guidance. For social workers, we have a section on our website on using nice guidance in social work. 
it does include some example scenarios showing how nice guidance can be used in social work practice. And those examples are by setting and also examples for principal social workers. And since our recommendations can be long, we produce quick visual guides on the key elements and they're called our quick guides. There's about 25 in the collection, but they're ideal for sharing with new staff or sharing with members of the public. So that's just a little bit about NICE and now I'm going to hand over to Simon. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. There we go. Let's just move that one. Excellent. Or oh, has that gone all wrong for me now? There we go. Let's just do that again. Excuse me. The beauties of Microsoft Teams. I'm more of a Zoom man. There we go. Can you all see that? Has that come up as full screen? Yeah, that's fine, Simon. Great, no problem. OK, so I'll just pull it down on my screen. Uh, push that one back. Slideshow from beginning. OK, so um, welcome everyone. My name's Simon Howarth. I know a few faces on here already. Um, so nice to sort of be be focused back in the West Midlands at the moment. Um, just a little bit about me and, and hopefully I've got the right uh, focus for today, Sarah and Deborah. My understanding is I'm going to speak to you about um, my research project, which is about assessment of child neglect and development of a new assessment or measurement tool for child neglect. But on top of that, to talk to you about the research base around neglect, um, its social nature and how we might respond in, in effective but humane and supportive ways. So just a little bit about me, as I say, I'm an academic at the University of Birmingham. Um, my research is, is focused on developing a practice relevant and usable neglect measurement tool to support more evidence based and informed assessments. It's an international project, so, so we've got input from both the UK and from a range of academics and practitioners internationally as well. And hopefully, as you'll see when I describe the methodology, it's really practice relevant and practice informed. So it's about people in practice, people receiving services, so experts by experience and other academics using our framework to develop this new tool. I know evidence based practice can be a swear word in social work, um, but I think hopefully unashamedly I, I come from an evidence based stance. I think it's slightly immoral to, to make decisions such as removing people's children's or liberty that are not based on the best available evidence. That, that to me seems rather unfair. So that, that's how we're approaching the project. But for us, that doesn't mean that evidence base is just about me as an academic saying what I know. It's about bringing people together in practice and those who use services to, um, to, to, to work together for a collaborative research project. As I come on to in a mode, the three primary phases of the project. Number one is a systematic review. I think Joe was just referring to those. I wouldn't recommend doing those as a practitioner. They take about a year to do, um, and ours involved um, the reviewing of over 5,000 national and international records on assessing child neglect. Phase two, which, which is a bit more sort of related or hopefully doable in social work is a Delphi study and I find it a bit surprising they're not more used in social work research so I'll come on to talk about Delphi studies a little bit and then phase three we're going to test the tool in practice. By the end of the project we aim to have a tool that's shorter, more accurate and reliable um, and valid sorry than the tools currently out there. So before I come on to the methodology, the method section, the issue is that neglect is really complicated. Neglect can be quite small in some people's minds, but it can be absolutely massive in other people's minds. It's really opaque and nebulous, so it's like a big rain cloud up there in the sky that, that kind of is really difficult to pin down. And the research, I've only put a couple of references here, but there could be many, many more. The research is clear that, that in practice, Professionals, not just social work, but across the board, struggle in their assessments. So doing accurate, informed assessments leading to focused responses and that actually responses can reflect some of the confusion and disarray that can be evident within families themselves. 
So I've broken my presentation down into sort of four main sections. Sarah and Deborah wanted me to talk about research methodology, at least that's how I understood it. Um, so I'm going to speak to you about how we're undertaking the project, hopefully to, I suppose, demystify to a degree sort of what research is um, and, and, and how, how it's undertaken. Thinking about the evidence-based approach, it comes sort of from the medical field to start with, and that, that's some of the reason that social workers push back against an evidence-based approach, and I understand that. But it, its its aim is fundamentally to, to decrease the gaps between research and practice, which is really helpfully um, what the teaching partnership are here sort of asked me to be, be here and for, for your future events to talk about. So it's about how can practice be more, more research informed. And really importantly, the number one mantra for evidence based practice is to avoid harm. And that's something I think we need to think long and hard about in social work around whether some of our interventions do cause more harm than good. It's not meant to be too structured or too strict. It's meant to act only as a guide for thinking. So when we're developing our neglect measurement tool, that is to support, not to replace professional judgment. The, the tool will still rely upon the expertise, knowledge and values of good social workers, such as I'm sure of many on, on this um, Microsoft Teams call. The next bits I've done pictorially to try and make it a little bit less boring, hopefully in a little bit more acceptable for everybody watching. So through the power of pictures, this slide tells us that neglect is complicated. As I was saying, it leaves practitioners perplexed. It leaves children disoriented and that we struggle. We struggle in academia. There's much less research into child neglect than, say, physical abuse or sexual abuse. We struggle in practice. Neglect forms the backdrop of many serious case reviews when things go wrong. And for families, it's a struggle to, to maybe get things to a point where family functioning is OK. So there's a lot of confusion and, and sometimes a lot of fear involved as well. And, and within research, so within my sphere, there's, there's really very little good quality research into neglect, particularly from the UK. There's more in, from the US, which we'll come on to, but knowledge for people in practice is more limited on neglect. But that's a problem because child neglect is prevalent, prevalent across all societies. And we'll come on to some of the figures in England. It now accounts for just under 50 percent of child, initial child protection plans. So it's a big problem for all of us. It's a big problem for children, their families, communities, professionals and societies. And it's really important to remember that. that although, although neglect is of, often about sort of ongoing harm, as opposed to trigger incidents, say, in physical abuse, of all forms of maltreatment that, that, that we come across as social workers, it leads to some of the most significantly harmful long term impacts for children. And it's really important to remember that neglect and what Brandon et al. define as catastrophic neglect can be fatal as well. Within the research, it's clear that current neglect measures are not viewed as good enough but that well-developed tools can support better assessments and can inform professional judgments. So our take is that a valid and reliable child neglect measurement tool for those in practice, designed with those in practice, should support more effective decision making. And hopefully then, as in the picture, the cube can come together and there can be less mystique and misunderstanding around neglect and its assessment. But for those of you who know me, there are a few on the call who do, most probably don't. I'm a particularly, well, I hope I am a particularly value based academic. I was a very value based social worker within child protection. And therefore, within my research, I'm applying a framework of social harm. I'll come on to this in more detail later on. But if you take one message from my presentation today, it's that the research is really very, 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 very clear that there are very strong links between poverty and neglect. 
and that our society and our current government are forcing more and more children into poverty. The statistics are out there. I don't need to quote them. They're on the BBC Guardian websites. The problem is that human and therefore family functioning and flourishing is compromised when you don't have the social and economic resources to get by. And that's what social harm looks like. So it's a theoretical framework for looking at the harms in society that are caused by the big actors, not the small actors, that actually have the most impact in people's lives. And this framework's being applied to develop a tool that's inclusive of wider inequalities and disadvantages. Again, I'd view, view it as a moral to develop a, a neglect tool, and there are ones out there that do this, that doesn't look at poverty, that doesn't look at homelessness, that doesn't look at racism in society, and how these, how these facets of society impact family functioning, and therefore the ability to meet children's needs. But I'll come on to that a little bit more a little bit later. So research, research is mis sort of uses a lot of big language, which is quite unnecessary a lot of the time. Research is quite a lot like practice, really, if you ask me. You need a good plan and you, and you need a good framework so that what you're doing is organised and so that you can get to your end result, in this case, a new tool in in systematic and informed ways. So as I said, phase one, we undertook a systematic review of, of national and international measures of child neglect. That, that included reviewing over 5,000 different studies um, and then condensing that, analysing what those studies could tell us about the current state of, of tools for assessing child neglect. And we'll come on to that. Phase two, which I'll talk about a bit more, is a Delphi study. The term comes from the Oracle at Delphi, and the basis of Delphi is, is you use a series of surveys, usually not more than three or certainly not more than four, done online now in the beautiful modern computer age, to gain the opinions of a range of experts on a topic. Where my study is slightly different, excuse me, is that we're using, although they do this at nice and fairness, but we're using a broader definition of what an expert is. So, so a number of Delphi studies go to other academics, for example, and tell me about this, your area. We, we think that isn't really OK for, for the project we're looking at. So for us, experts are academics who focus on neglect or measurement, but they're, they're social work practitioners, managers, practitioners within the voluntary sector and beyond who, who work with neglect and really importantly parents who who have had social work or other intervention for neglect they bring a lived experience of expertise as to what would be useful for them when neglect is assessed phase three is is hopefully where it gets a bit more fun then then we've got the tool together and then we're, we're going to pilot it that the project did start in the west midlands but about six months ago, we changed to um, practice partners here where I live in beautiful, sunny Wales. So we're now piloting it with um, Neathport Talbot and Newport in South Wales. So that that's the kind of basis of our methodology. It You know, it's as simple as it looks in paper. Research takes time. That That's what you've got to focus on. Research has got to be systematic, so it's got to be ordered. But actually, once you get a few of the basic ideas and you demystify it in your own mind, research is not harder than than social work practice or any other form of practice. So, as I said, we did this big systematic review. I, I don't think that's suitable for practitioners to undertake. I think there are other forms of literature review where you could sort of rapidly look at the literature. But systematic reviews are a big sort of uh, documentary um, analysis uh, undertaking, really. Our systematic review um, took about a year. As I say, 5,000 records. We had to develop our own tools to extract data, etc. So it's quite an undertaking. The, the headlines are that there was a lack of suitable tools that had been that had been rigorously tested in practice. Our analysis revo revealed how much the tools that have been rigorously tested don't cover in terms of neglect. 
and it fitted with the wider literature of, of a big limitation in, in a rigorous evidence base for social workers to assess neglect. So for me, the sort of blame around poor assessments can't lie just in practice. The responsibility or blame, however you want to put it, has to lie with academia as well. So I'm really glad that stage is done. It was very interesting, sort of very useful, but not always the most interesting when you're spending hours and hours looking at different records and articles about child neglect. This is where we're at now. There's a lovely picture of the Oracle at Delphi. I kind of wish I was there because we've got storms coming tomorrow, but unfortunately I'm not. So th this complements the, the findings of the systematic review. So in areas where there isn't much good research like neglect, a good way to approach it is to do a systematic review so you find out what's known already and then to complement that with a Delphi study. So bringing all this expertise into one nice, neat place and using that knowledge to take things forwards. Delphi's, I think, would be very suitable for practitioners to undertake. All it takes is a bit of training um, and then with your interpersonal skills as social workers, um, and your analytical skills as social workers, you'd be off and going. On ours, which doesn't have to be the case, we're starting with three online focus groups. The focus groups are where you bring usually sort of between eight and 12 people together to share their views. We're using those focus groups to get some really general ideas from our experts as to what they think should be included in the new tool. You know, what should it measure? What types of neglect should it focus on, et cetera? So that will help us to funnel down. This whole research project is about funneling down to so starting with a question, doing the systematic review. This is what's known, using expert opinion really broadly through focus groups and then funneling down to the surveys. And in the surveys, we'll be asking more specific questions of our panel of experts um, as to what exactly should be in the tool. And then as we get onto surveys two and three, we then ask them to rate items. So we'll have focused on what they should be in the tool and then they score what they think is most important. And then that leaves us with the items to put into the tool. So it's seeking consensus from a range of experts. The really nice thing about Delphi's is that they can avoid groupthink. So when you're sat in a room with people quite often, as I'm sure you're all aware from your child protection conferences, one powerful voice says something and then the rest of the people follow that. The Delphi's are an anonymous process. For us, that was really important because when you've got parents and sort of esteemed academics from, say, Australia uh, and America, it's important that there isn't a feeling of inferiority or a feeling where power is influencing what people feel they're able to say. So that's a real benefit of Delphi's. The other benefit of Delphi's for us, and I think for most of the people who use them, is you can bring together a real geographically dispersed group of people to share their opinions in a financially and sort of time efficient way. After the Delphi phase and some analysis of what people have said, we'll have our tool to support more effective decision making. As I said, that plans to be shorter, so it's got to be focused for practice. A lot of tools for social work are too long at the moment. It's got to be accurate. It's got to sort of measure actual neglect. It's got to be reliable and it's got to be valid in a range of settings. After that, we'll be at this beautiful sunny stage, excuse me, where we'll pilot the tool. So we're going gonna, to gonna link with multi-agency practitioners, so health, education, social care and beyond for them to use the draft tool. And that's a really nice way to find out, all right, this worked in theory, how does it work in practice? So we'll then ask their, those practitioners and the families they're working with to provide feedback on, on, you know, is the tool any good? Is it usable? And does it assess child neglect? We'll use feedback forms. And again, focus groups, they're a nice way to bring voices together. And then we'll further refine the tool to be used in other settings. We're very fortunate that, that, that we've got interest from 
uh, America, Canada, uh, Australia and China at the moment to to um, to test the, the tool once it's developed. So then we'll be able to test the tool in, in a broad range of geographical and cultural settings to see whether whether it fits other cultures and geographical locations or whether we need to um, whether ne need to refine it further or indeed develop other versions. Any questions on that bit as I stop sharing my window? Any questions from people before I go on and talk about neglect? Elaine, I recognise your fine. name, I believe. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm all right. This might seem a really naive question, but how does this differ from graded care profile? I knew the graded care profile would come out. That's I'm glad you raised it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, graded care profile. I think there's a slight misunderstanding. Graded care profile measures levels of care. That's what that's about, Elaine. It's a big form that measures level of care in emotional care, physical care, etc. Our tool aims to be much, much shorter and more focused on actual neglect. So we're talking about it will have a typology of neglect, which I'll come on to in a minute. It will talk about severity and chronicity of neglect, and it will talk about a focused plan as to how that neglect can be addressed. So it's focused less on. Le and it's really hard, isn't it, to think that sometimes you've got to separate levels of care to actual neglect and impact for the child. And where we're at, Elaine, is actual neglect and impact for the child. So it can be used for evidence in either stepping cases down or stepping cases up to care proceedings. Thank you, Simon. Absolute pleasure. Other <laughs> questions? Nice to see you, Elaine. I love your wallpaper as well. They're beautifully um, colourful. Any Thank other you. questions? It's a very quiet audience. OK, no problem. We shall carry on. That's OK. So I shall go from current slide. There we go. So that that's our research project. Um, we shall, will have our neglect measurement tool ready um, but by the end of, of, of this year, certainly should be by sort of autumn time. And then the project can really move forwards. Um, please think that the sort of research is accessible for you as practitioners. Um, and if anyone is interested or wants to know more about Delphi's, I did send some reading out prior to the session to try and demystify them and show they can be quite simple. I do think they're a real useful and under uh, underused, sorry, method of research for social work. So when I spoke to Deborah and Sarah, we also spoke about sort of bringing the research base on neglect to you as a group. So that's where I'm going to focus on now. Um, I'm going to hopefully have an activity with you. I'm hoping we can get you into breakout rooms. If not, then um, we'll have to do it as, as a main group. Um, but I should talk on a little bit more for now until we get to the first activity. So the important thing to say is that, that, as I said earlier, child neglect is prevalent across all societies. It's really difficult to, to determine accurately the pre prevalence of neglect because, because, you know, by default, there will be a number of neglect cases that don't come, for example, to the attention of professional services. Um, it accounts for 48 percent of initial child protection plans. So almost half of initial child protection plans are now under neglect. So it's something that, that I'm guessing all of you are coming across in practice. International comparisons are difficult, but, but the data is very clear from a range of other countries. It's a big problem for them too. For example, in America, it accounts for 75 percent of initial referrals to child protective services and the majority of recurrent maltreatment reports. The majority of reports where where families come back into the system are for neglect. The official numbers in all countries are comparatively low when you compare them to sort of qualitative studies where people have gone out and spoken to children, young people or young adults. One by Radford et al found that, that one in six young adults stated they'd been neglected during their childhoods and, and, and a quite worrying one in 10 said that they'd been severely neglected during their childhood. So it's a big problem for all of us and it costs families but also communities and society more generally. 
But it's, it's sort of neglect grown. And I th maybe that counts partly as to why it's almost 50 percent of child protection plans. It can now be used as a catch all category of harm. It's understood as, as, a, as, a, as a heterogeneous, so a, a varied concept that, that includes a whole array of experiences for children and young people. The real debates in academia, whether we should sort of focus on on children's basic needs not being met, and that's how we define neglect or parental emissions in care. And quite rightly, classification as neglect is, is complicated by the role of wider social and political contexts. As we'll come on to, you can't separate a lot of neglect from poverty and insecure housing, for example. It's really important to say the range of experiences for young people and children also encumber a whole range of different feelings and level of fear for the children and young people themselves. If you're more sort of pictorially or sort of orientated like I am sometimes, this is our um, theory of change for our project. It's It's been developed from the literature on children's needs, the literature on neglect, um, and consultation with our advisory group of practitioners and service users. In the middle, you've got a nice box there, children's basic needs, remembering that's what we're all coming back to, needs for love, health, etc. Neglect we, we see as, as needs persistently not met, and that's our typology of neglect. So emotional, medical, physical, educational, social neglect, and lack of supervision and guidance. On the left, in the sort of yellowy orange, you've got risk factors, but not just at family level, ranging from societal level, so deprivation and inequality, through to children's own vulnerabilities. Absence of support networks is key to many neglect cases, but also there are, there are responsibilities on multi-agency teams to effectively assess and respond to neglect. On the right, you've got the protective factors ranging from a, a fairer and more humane society through to good family functioning and down to accurate assessments leading to focused, inclusive support. Compared to other forms of abuse, the drivers for neglect are quite complex. So most neglect cases involve this complex dance of personal, familial, community and social factors. And the research is very clear that in practice, we're better at focusing on personal and familial and potentially community factors, but not so much wider disadvantages. Chronic neglects and neglect, cases of neglect that are ongoing and severe often involve a multiplicity of issues leading to some of the confusion that's evident in assessments. That's that's ranging from socioeconomic disadvantage to domestic abuse within the home. Fitzpatrick's done some great work in the field of homelessness. And from his work, we can sort of look at neglect at economic, interpersonal and individual levels. As I'll come on to a bit, the focus can be moved from then just sort of focusing on parental blame or parental responsibility to analysing the contributions of community and structural factors also. It's really important that neglect is not just for young children. In fact, some of the worst outcomes in serious case reviews for, of neglect are for young people themselves and not young children. And that can come on at any time with life stresses such as breakdown in parental relationships or loss of support. Sarah and Deborah, are we able to go into small groups? Is that doable? I can make that. Sorry, I've been Sorry, doing that. <laughs> I can make that happen, that Simon. Happen. Yes, yeah. um, we'll have that's to, great. Just, um, yeah, just yeah, bear, with, bear me. with me. That's cool. I'll just put my slide up while you're doing that and show people the question for them. So the question is, in small groups, I just want you sort of 10 minutes to come up with your own definitions of neglect. Believe it or not, in my research, I know most state definitions now ranging from the UK to Australia. So any cheeky ideas of using those won't be accepted. I want to know from you as professionals what you think neglect should be defined as. Thank you.
Just to do it is yeah. another yeah. option as well. Yeah. Karen, you've got your hand up. I kind of see you, but... <laughs> oh, my camera's on. Oh, um, okay, sorry. <laughs> here I am, here I am. Well, uh, we talked about uh, an absence of appropriate care, and it, that it can also be active or passive. And we were talking about the example of social media and how many children are now receiving a lack of stimulation because their parents are on their phones or a screen or mm. and that that's a sort of insidious form of neglect. Mm. Thank you, Karen. Other views? We were we were wondering as well about whether neglect is actually Rather than just seeing it from the perspective of the child, whether it is about the absence of responsibility of the state Lovely. So to provide the kind of financial and the you know, socioeconomic circumstances and living circumstances to support the child, both to the parent, well, to the parents, to enable the child. Great point, Sean, and, and I'll come on to that. If, if no one else wants to listen to that, I'm now confident that at least you will. So that's good. Carol, you've got your hand up. Is that the lovely yes. background you've got there? Yeah. Uh, yes. Doing 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 my bit for LGBTQ uh, this month. Um, we were just talking about uh, physical and emotional uh, impairment um, for children by their parents or their caregivers, um, and the impact um, that that has on their developmental needs. But then we had quite an interesting conversation about disadvantage through that wider socio-economic um, you know, poverty, poor housing um, uh, as well. So it's not just about parents and caregivers, it's about the state as well. Thanks, Carol. Any other views? Some lovely views so far. A man, is that how I pronounce it? I'm rubbish at pronunciation, I hope so. You're nearly there, Simon, it's Ammon. Oh, God, oh that's, that's where I was going to go. Oh, yeah, got it. Thank you. <laughs> Simon, we, we're talking, we ran out of time, but we were having some conversations around how the definition of neglect might vary per culture and how may, how we right. may um, interpret one circumstances as, as neglectful, but the individual family and service users may not see that as neglect, neglectful and how we challenge sensitively where there are safeguarding concerns without causing offence. Yeah. Um, just oh, lovely. That, that's such an interesting point. And, and um, without boring you, something we're wrestling with on the project, actually, because um, as well as the side you've said, there's the other side that the state should leave some stuff that isn't neglect that they might not like. That's the other side, isn't it? There was a great judgment. I forget who it was around, you know, basically we can't get into social engineering. We've got to put up with levels and types of parenting that we ourselves might not like. But if we got involved with all of those, then we'd be removing probably over 50 percent of children. That that's a really good point. Some lovely points in my group, some great points, something I just like to put back. And I am a social worker. I remained a registered social worker. So I mean this from the position of a social worker. What what was raised in mine was. That sort of age old social work line, it's on an individual case by case basis, but I just don't think that's OK anymore. Um, I'm also involved with sort of a lot of parental groups and work with there. I, I just if you, if you think if you were a parent and Carol was your social worker and I was a social worker and we were basing it on individual and our individual views, you know, under Carol, you might be under a child protection plan. Under me, you might not get any services. So I really think we've got to have much as it's really sort of like swear words to say, I do think we've got to have a more uniformed, informed approach where we, we actually sort of set out and have the confidence of oppression to go, this is neglect, this is not a neglect, whether it's in Sandwell, Dudley, or where I am in, in, in sunny Wales. So I'll leave that one out there and I'll just move on to some more slides. Thank you so much for those wonderful contributions. So slideshow from current slide. There we go. That should be up now. So just thinking quickly about definitions and assessment. We kind of covered this, so I'll go through it quite quickly. There are issues, you know, and that's not just for practice. That's for, for, for scholarship, so for, for academia as well. 
you know, abuse is typically defined as an act. Neglect is often associated with things that aren't done. And I love this sort of phrase, uh, this statement from Zuravan uh, uh, that neglect is is the most subjective of all legally recognised concepts. And that's why I kind of laid that little teaser at the end there around, you know, that leaves it open to a hell of a lot of interpretation between different practitioners. Definitions range from the simple, a lovely one from Gabarino and Collins, where they said it's a pattern of behaviour or a social context that has a hole in the middle where we should find the meeting of basic developmental needs. I really like that one. But then it goes from that to the far more complicated ones that you'll find in working together, which I'm sure you're all aware of. And I won't sort of repeat the mantra here. The problem for us all, the problem, I guess, for me and my research project as well, is that if we can't define something, it's really difficult to measure it. So sort of the lack of clarity in defining what neglect is leads to challenges how to assess it. How do you quantify something that you don't know how to define? Without such without a clear definition, we don't have clear constructs, a clear sort of parts of neglect to measure. So we don't know sort of how big the thing of neglect is. And as I said, neglect is really neglect has grown, believe it or not, an awful lot in the last 30 years. And you could just keep adding things until it just becomes too big to measure. These are really important considerations given the long standing issues in social work around inaccuracy of assessments. There are a range of neglect typologies. So typology is, is you know, different types, a, a framework of different types of neglect. And that adds to the complexity of the whole situation. Branded et al, who do a lot on serious case reviews, for example, they, they, they've done one on catastrophic neglect. Um, I've, I've leaned on the work by Horwath. Jan Horwath is a particularly nice person and I think a particularly good academic. So we revised her typology of neglect. And as it said in the theory of change, that's medical um, medical, emotional, educational, social and physical neglect and lack of supervision or, 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 and, or guidance. Sorry. Also, different severities of neglect. Neglect isn't an either or situation. And this is really difficult because our child protection systems are based on trigger events. So child protection systems are really good at going. A child has been hit. There's a bruise. Let's act. They're much less good at going. There's this continuing harm. When do we act? And that comes out in a lot of ca uh, case judgments and always also serious case reviews. So it can range from a child's being needs being partially met to sort of that extreme deprivational neglect where a child's needs simply aren't met at all. To add to the complexity, children and young people often ex experience sort of multiple forms of abuse referred to as multi-type maltreatment and episodes of maltreatment across different developmental stages. Another, if you want to take a point from today, it's that multi-developmental stage maltreatment. So if you're if you're experiencing maltreatment as a young child and then a middle child and as, as an older child, you're you're going to be more harmed. That multi multi developmental stage maltreatment has particularly negative impacts for long term adaptation and functioning. So into adulthood and beyond. And it's really important to recognise that neglect can lead to significant harm, but also to fatality. I could probably spend an hour and a half just talking about the list of potential impacts of neglect, but that would be deep, deeply boring for me and for you. But, you know, poor physical and mental health, physical impacts of chronic stress, delays in language, communication skills. The, the list goes on and on. A single incident of neglectful care can lead to fatality. But to make it even more complex for everyone in practice, multiple episodes of neglect, for example, being repeatedly unsupervised may lead to, to the re child remaining uninjured and back to the slides before you then there's the, the question if you focus just on impact for the child is that neglect 
or isn't it? Between 2005 and 11, there were 57 children with a current or past child protection plan for neglect whose death prompted a serious case review. That's quite a significant number of children and young people. But this is where I'm at. Neglect is a social form of harm. And I presented on this to a range of range of clientele. So neglect compared to other forms of abuse is associated with these multiple risk factors from from the familial to the societal level, which some of you were starting to talk about a couple of minutes ago. Consistently linked to neglect of poverty and the nature of social support and social relationships. If you are in poverty and you do not have a good social support network, then things are going to be extremely difficult. There is disagreement in the literature whether sort of proximal factors such as parenting have, a, have, a, have the greatest impact on children or whether distal factors such as poverty have the greatest impact on children and whether their needs are met. What's very clear is that practice focuses on those proximal factors, those close family factors and not those distal wider societal factors. And considerations also got to be given, I'm afraid, to organisational and societal neglects. So organisational neglect at a basic level is when social work or other organisations are in a state of chaos themselves and they're compromised in their responses to neglect cases. In, the, in, in, in their review, their biannual, biannual analysis of serious case reviews, Brand et al identify this as a very significant issue. So it's not just me saying that, it's evident in many serious case reviews. But, but what's just as important or more important perhaps in my mind is societal neglect. It is a thing, it's been named in academic literature, thank God. And this is characterised by children and families being provided with insufficient resources to function, leading significant social disadvantage and their human rights being denied. Horwath, who, who's written an awful lot around neglect, she's combined these two concepts. She states that indirect societal neglect is evident in the application of a public management approach to children's social services. This has resulted in organisational targets rather than the needs of the child and the family themselves driving our service delivery. And this brings us on to the social harm approach. So to remind you, this is the theoretical framework that's driving the development of an, our neglect measurement tool. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theory, a framework that was originally developed in the criminology field that's come through social policy. And now I'm sort of positing it in social work. So it's about this context of wider social relationships and forces within which we're all embedded in our personal and professional lives. As Pemberton, who's my colleague, has written extensively about social harm, he states that it's predicated on notions of positive liberty and is able to capture harms that result when human, flour human flourishing is compromised by the denial of social resources. So these role of resources, social capital oppressions are all seen to influence how specific harms impact on people's lives. And it's really important that those similar decisions or acts, depending on your place in society, can be experienced very, very differently and as more or less harmful. Neoliberal regimes, of which the UK has many features, have consistently higher levels of these social harms than other regimes such as social democratic regimes in France and Germany. I won't go on for ages about social harms, but I'll give you a quick talk on it. There are physical autonomy and relational harms. Poverty is the main autonomy harm that affects everyone in society, and it's the largest source of social harm in all societies. Autonomy harms focus on people's capacities to self actualize and function in society and whether society allows them to do that and provides them with resources to achieve that. Relational harms are really important to social work 
Those come from enforced social exclusion or as can happen with child protection, social misrecognition. It can have a range of impacts as social networks offer us an awful lot of support and when those are taken away, functioning can be very difficult. A lack of social connection can also lead to mental health issues such as depression and social anxiety. So Jack, who wrote about the ecological approach and neglect back in 1997, when the world was a very different place. But this statement by Jack captures for me why a social harm framework can be considered fundamental to how we understand and respond to neglect. This is reinforced by the deep concern that discussions about child protection and systems of child protection are woefully disconnected from wider analysis and appreciation of what actually harms children within society and the relationships between these harms and wider socioeconomic forces. As I said, relational harms, I think, are particularly significant for neglect, given the lack of support networks and social isolation quite often that such families um, endure. And it's really important, I can't emphasize this enough, that there are strong links. You know, I could put I could put 20, 30, 40, 50 references at the end of that first sentence. Much social work research that is rigorous is from the US. That's they've done an awful lot of work on neglect and poverty, and also the sort of in poverty differences as to which families experience neglect and which don't. Bywaters et al. done some great research in the UK. There's a strong link between socioeconomic status and, and your chance of his experience child abuse and neglect. Evidence of this is found repeatedly across developed countries. Stevenson's written a lot around neglect, proposes that often it can be quite difficult to differentiate between what's unsatisfactory care through poverty or through generally sort of lack of concern or functioning. There's a gradient to the relationship. The more severe the economic hardship, the greater both the likelihood and severity of child abuse and neglect. Evidence from the US has revealed that raising the income for economically disadvantaged families had statistically, so it met a statistical threshold for, for, for significant impacts in reducing rates of abuse, but particularly neglect. So lo and behold, providing families living in poverty with greater income led to considerably less neglect for their children. Certainly poverty and deprivation should be significant considerations for us all on this call. When we consider that children living in the most deprived areas in England are 13 times more likely to be subject to a CP plan and 11 times more likely to become a looked after child than those living in the least deprived. Either we as social work say there's something morally wrong about working class families like the ideas in Victorian times. I find those ideals detestable or we say that we've got an issue that we need to address as a service with other services around how we engage and intervene in families. It's not to be blamed at individual practitioners. This is a systems issue that needs to be addressed more widely. And within official guidance and talk of child and abuse and neglect, poverty is hardly ever mentioned. And it's shown in research that our professional systems struggle to accommodate the social nature of neglect and the relational complexity involved. Rather, tending to focus on de deficiencies in parenting is easier for us to do that. The individualising narrative of neglect is embodied, embodied within our legal definitions of neglect across the Western world. So it's really important to think a bit more as a group, which is on to our next exercise, if you don't mind. So how can you as a service or you as an individual rebalance professional responses to neglect to think how they can be more humane and supportive? How can you capture 
this link between neglect, poverty and disadvantage within your assessments. And Deborah, if I can come back to you for maybe some groups of five or six mins, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Simon. I'm, I'm just going to do that now. That now. You're very kind, thank you. Hi, Helena. I must be mindful of time. It's all good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm mindful of time. So I'll leave those thoughts with you. There's some wonderful thoughts in my group. Thanks to all three of you. Some really sort of value based um, social work responses. As I say, when I say there are issues, I never think it's about individual social workers. I think it's about systems that need to change to support social workers to to do what, what they want to do, which is to help families who are out there. I'm just mindful of time. So I'm going to just I don't want to go from the beginning. I'm just going to think about some of pointers for practice in terms of neglect. So as I said, you know, that there's. There's got to be a more socially just approach to, to neglect. You know, there's got to be a less family focused and, and, and a focus away from just the family to actually are the, the community and society resources for this family to meet their child's needs. That should support a rebalance between narratives of individual parental failings to a sort of more nuanced understanding of these interplay of factors, but it's also got to feature the narratives of children and parents themselves. Issues such as poverty and disadvantage need to become essential elements. I think for neglect in particular, the, 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 a re-emphasising, a re-linking between you as wonderful social workers and the communities that you work in, lots of whom have a lot of social cap capital, sorry, in diff difficult circumstances, and a relinking to preventative early help would be really helpful. We're all value-based practitioners and viewing issues facing families as structural and social and looking at social injustices should be central to all that we do. And this is where I put a bit of a challenge back to you, perhaps as practitioners as to well as your systems. So evidence based practice is the conscientious, explicit use of information to serve as your foundation for practice. It's argued that research evidence is rarely used to underpin assessments and decisions in practice. When I took my son and he'd spiral fractured his leg. I took him to a hospital and they didn't go. I think that might be spiral fractured, mate, because of a case I met last week or because what my colleague Dave told me. They used the research evidence on what the signs meant. They then did a thorough assessment through X-raying his leg and that then went to a specialist bone doctor, as I called him, to assess what needed to happen. Otherwise, my son would be hobbling in, 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 the, in, in the form of some Victorian child to this day. So it needs to change. The problem is when practice wisdom solely guides assessments without the, all of our assumptions being critically dissected by valid evidence, problems can ensue for those we work with. And there's an unfair service between different families. For example, neglect being blamed on parents when it's not them who are the origin. The research is clear that families want to feel more involved as informed participants within child protection in particular. 
and that they want to be made aware of the known effectiveness or otherwise of assessments and interventions. And again, I just gently put that back to you as a group. Do you know the effectiveness of the signs of safety? Do you know the effectiveness of the graded care profile? Do you know the effectiveness of restorative practice? Are the figures to back that up? Evidence-based practice should be an ethical endeavour working with families, so they are the experts. Evidence-based practice is about a trium triumvirate of, of, of professional, that's you, evidence over here and family. You all come together with your knowledge and expertise for better solutions and ways forward. We make big decisions in social work that have profound impacts, lifelong impacts for children and their families. I don't view it as ethical to, to do that on less than the best available evidence. As Sheldon argued, the real concern is it's only when the poor and disadvantaged, and we've seen from the early slides of how we intervene disproportionately in poor and disadvantaged families, are the recipients of services that we allow ourselves to be so relaxed about the evidence base. Evidence-based practice argues for policy as well as practice to be informed by the best available evidence. So it pushes up to those who are making decisions, be they councillors or national government, as well as pushing down. In the group that I was in, they were very clear that, that they like and they think it's important to advocate for resources. But to do that, I'd argue you've got to do that from a position of knowledge which is the key idea of evidence-based practice. I'd argue, and specifically in terms of neglect, that we've got to be more focused on different types of neglect to make it perhaps a little bit simpler for us to break it down. Neglect is this big, dark rain cloud at the moment, but maybe if we break it down into these different types of neglect and our assessments specifically focus on those, then that might provide more clarity. I think assessments need to focus specifically on the timing of neglect and the impact on the child, the severity of neglect, how bad is the neglect and how long has the neglect been going on? The national framework is still there. Um, I say we should use more of the family environmental domain rather than putting one or two <laughs> sentences under each of those. And our assessments need to look more at link the type of neglect with the age when it starts and how that impact could be. For example, nutritional neglect might have a particular impact for a young child, an older child might be able to be resilient to that and cope with that more effectively. There's a sort of there's a lack of evidence in what interventions or practice models are effective in responding to neglect, but there are some ideas out there. A number of authors recognise that our interventions, particularly for chronic neglect cases, need to be long term. But that can be an issue going against the current climate of short term working. The research is very clear that you've got to have a multi agency or inter agency response to neglect and that sometimes this will be over a period of years. Neglect cases can be characterised by repeated episodes of intervention, and that, I do recognise, creates an awful lot of demand for services. Hallworth talks about intensive interventions which they've used in America. Those typically involve sort of a multi-agency team going in, in a, in a very focused and intense way with family, including home visiting, parenting support, development of social networks and therapeutic elements to, to, to support relationships within families. That can be a, effective, but it's not a panacea answer. Practice frameworks, which I know are the vogue, such as signs of safety, restorative practice or in relationship based practices they're using down in Sussex. Those are based within strengths-based paradigms, but it needs to be really clear that they're not yet been found to be effective. In fact, um, in, in Australia and states in Australia where signs of safety started, um, they now bring more rather than less children into care, despite the initial idea of it being to prevent that happening. 
So although they may have some use for neglect, you'd need to think that intelligent is a practitioner, whether it fits or whether you need some other evidence to back that up also. Burgess et al state that the characteristics of you as workers and the empathy you provide are really influential in case of neglect, where ideas of stigma and sort of social isolation can be really clear. The practice based frameworks I've spoke about. Do use them, I'm not saying don't use them, but please use them judiciously as intelligent practitioners have recognised that the evidence for their effectiveness is not there yet. So my key messages. Neglect is a social form of harm. It's characterised by these interplays of personal, family, community and social factors. It's complex, social and opaque. For me, that means you've got to use clear evidence and clear frameworks and tools to assess it. Otherwise, confusion can lead for you as workers as well as families. And please remember, it's a social form of harm when our societies are becoming increasingly unequal. I would really like social work to return to its roots of welfare advocacy, for example, and that, as has been shown with evidence from America, raising the income of poorer families can significantly reduce the incidences of neglect. And I hope that your assessments and interventions going forward at least have some some sort of notion that that's something to consider. I think I'm all right for time, Sarah and Deborah, and I'm getting a dry throat now, so I shall stop talking. Thanks so much for listening. Any questions are most welcome. Um, that's that's the presentation. I'm in time, which I didn't think I would be. So there you go. That's really good. Elaine, you're back yes, with your lovely Simon. wallpaper. Um, this was really interesting and a lot of food for thought, a, a lot a, a lot of refre reflection to do. Uh, given it's World Social Work Day soon, are you going to repeat this um, for others to access? Well, yeah, I, I, I can do. I am doing some other things on World Social Work Day, but yes, I'm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm always, I think uh, it's so accessible to take things away. Yeah, a lot of it, you know, some of it's gone over my head and I'll have to think about it. But there's a lot of colleagues across the region yeah, that could I'm, really utilise this. Yeah, I, I'm not, a, as you know, Elaine, I'm not a, I'm not a sort of stick in the ivory tower academic. I like being linked to practice um, and I like sort of, you know, I quite often do things for free where other people charge money. So um, I, I don't mind getting out there at all because I think it's a bit immoral for me to say, this should change and then not be willing to sort of talk to people about how that might be a thing. So, yeah, of course I will. And I you are you still in Sandwell, Elaine? Yeah. You, yeah. What your your practitioner was talking very positively about how in Sandwell you're trying to address some of these social harms and indeed cultural harms. So that I find really heartwarming to hear, too. Yeah, I mean, I know Adam's just put that this is recorded, but to get the interaction with yourself and others, it's great to have it live again. So yeah, no, I'll yeah. happily do it if, if anyone wants me to. Of course I will. As long as thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Any other questions or points? And I genuinely like your wallpaper. I feel really boring behind me. I'm going to have to change it, but I'm not very good at home decorating. Um, other questions or points? Uh, Helen, Helena. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you very much for this uh, training. It's really good. Um, uh, I have a question. It looks like most of the children who come into care uh, uh, is because of the neglect. And I'm wondering why, if we have such a huge number of children come into care and we have less research on it, is there any reason? Yes. Yeah, so so um, I think that's a really good question i don't have a, a sort of straight answer for that i think i think there's been a little bit of a sort of pushing away of neglect in research because it's harder to research it would have been so much easier for me to go i'm going to develop a simple tool for physical abuse to basically say you know have you smacked your child does that make sense those kind of things um Yes, Carolyn, in Wales, it's now banned to any smack, which I think is the way it should go. But that's my personal value point on that. But but 
therefore, I think the whole idea of getting in this murky world of neglect can be quite off-putting for academics when quite often research projects are time limited and you're more likely to have a successful output, I guess, if you focused on a more obvious form of abuse like physical abuse than neglect. But I don't think that's good enough. There is research on neglect. There's some good stuff from America, um, but a lot of it lacks the sort of rigour that you can trust it, really. Um, and, and yet neglect is absolutely so. See, as I say, sort of almost 50 percent of initial child protection plans now. Um, so I, I think we, we do need to change our practice. Sean. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Just to pick up your point about the kind of welfare advocacy, because we discussed that a little in our yeah. group, and I think that's a really important point. And I think professionally, I mean, I'm from an adults background, but whether it be adults or children, I think professionally, we've been rather quiet, especially over the ten past ten years or so, in terms of changing this whole dynamic around austerity, whether it be individually or collectively, and the clearly, as you're indicating from the research, exacerbate some of these problems around the neglect. So I think we need to, yeah, individually and collectively take a bit more responsibility, but also our leaders take a bit more responsibility about putting this kind of, putting this to government, putting this on the table and work challenging and working this through. Absolutely, Sean, and you've put it far better than I could do that's really nicely put I think if we all act a little bit then you've got a collective voice you know for me Sean good social work should be a thorn in the side of government shouldn't it because that that's what we should be we should be advocating you know I, I did social work interviews yesterday I'm our admissions tutor every single one of those applicants says I want to advocate for human rights and needs that's their starting point. I imagine that was the starting point for every single person on this call. I want to support people. I think to do that, we have got to be a bit more political. But that, <laughs> that's what I teach my students. They can either take that or leave it. Um, but I, I think we do. And I think in the next year, I think, or 18 months, they're saying another 300,000 children are going to be put into poverty. you got me going now, Sean, but we're, we're a rich country that that just shouldn't yeah. be that shouldn't yeah. be happening there should be no families who have no recourse to public funds based on racist um government policies that that so, so to me it's social work that's where we should be at yeah yeah definitely. thanks sean definitely with you Thanks, Sean. Carol, one more, because I must, I've got another meeting I'm sharing at half oh, three. Right, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm no, just so really sorry. quickly, it's, it's been really thought provoking. We were talking in our group just around the wide range of uh, social work and the things that you have to do to be one minute in court, that seeking permanent removal away through to helping somebody with their uh, housing um, and, you know, electricity and how you span that range. And where do you think community social workers are these days because they're not there anymore are they and it's a it's a it's a missing and a, and a huge gap to help you know communities to kind of galvanize to wrap around families that are not uh you know doing as well um uh you know as, as other as others and i think it would not just help families but social work there's this there's this gap isn't there now between social work and particularly child protection and families and i remember being working summer carol and they moved the office from the area and it was almost seemed to be a purposeful move you know to this sort of pre and i was like actually how are the families going so i think community social work absolutely should happen i think i think you know my research now based in wales i just went to this without boring you to this wonderful school yesterday in the most deprived part of Neathport Talbot where basically they're doing community social work and they've got a family support worker there and they're linking parents and they've got a parents group and he said all I want from the local authority is for them to put a social worker in my school does that make sense so that we can work together so I think there is I think there is desire for that in in some areas but I guess um leadership have got to take that forward too the other point I'd say Carol I, I do think and I've said this for a good few years now I do think we now face so much that we've got to specialize as social workers back to my son if he'd had a generic doctor he'd have been hobbling now he had a specialist doctor who looked at that who reset his leg you know if you really want to move forward in neglect you should have a neglect champion you should have a physical abuse champion a sexual exploitation champion um and I must go but the last point I also think in children and families and, and I've been unashamedly children and families 
Social worker Sean, I think it's time that we learn more from adults now. They're making some great use of family group conferencing. They're making some great use of genuinely strengths-based approaches. And I think it's time that we step a little bit off our high horse in children and families and go, like adults are doing some great stuff. We, we could learn from that too. I must run. It's been an absolute pleasure. If anybody sort of, I think my email's there or not. If not, then ask for it. If any of you are interested, I'll, I'll come and talk to you or whatever. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me. I'm sorry to be the one to run first. I feel a bit rude, but I must do because I'm showing the next meeting at half three. Um, and lovely to talk to so many um, value based and wonderful practitioners. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Simon. Bye. Thank Thanks, everyone. So just to confirm, we'll get the slides sent out to everybody afterwards who's attended and um, hopefully get the recording as well on the website soon. So um, so people can have that to watch back as well. But thank you. And I think that we'll be sending out a, a questionnaire as well, a survey, just if you can give some feedback on the session, just so we can um, we can learn from learn from this to make sure we're always getting things as good as we can. But thank you. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks to you, Joanne. Bye. 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 Bye.